What is wrong? If you see Genesis chapter 3, he said to Adam, of all the trees, please put it up, let them say, of every tree in the garden you will eat. The only one I kept for me is one tree. One, one. Eat all. I've never seen that type of person. Only one. But the day you now cross this boundary, you will die. What did Satan do? It is that one that God keeps on himself. He will be pushing people, pushing you. 10% again. And the house said, no. Everything I taught, I taught it from the standpoint that our goal is not to fault the fathers who may have taught contrary things. The revelations they have and what they have taught is what God gave them for their generation. What God is telling us now is for our own generation. If we preach what we are preaching now in their generation, they may stone us. And if they preach what they are preaching in our own generation, it may not be received. Because revelation is progressive and the dealings of God is also dispensational. So God is moving. So what we teach is an update from what they have taught after all they were the ones that led us to christ we didn't wake up and say now we need to know jesus we are wise no it is what they taught us that brought us here but now that they have raised us god is adding more syllables to what he has done before so this is not an attempt to start pointing and say hey this pastor said this one that one no we are dealing with different generations they have served their own generation it's our time to serve our own generation and this is the revelation god is giving us the generation that will come after us we know the ones that we have not known from the same scripture we are reading and they will bring things out we'll be shocked was this thing there because they also have their own revelation for their own generation a father cannot be wrong a father cannot be you don't correct a father correction upward is rebellion correction upward you don't correct a father a father cannot be wrong a father can be wrong before god but before you a father cannot be wrong you can't start talking down on one you claim is your father Otherwise, you're a fake son. I could not pick anything wrong in his teachings while his head in high esteem in my heart. I still refer to him and recall to him and still study God's light through him. So you see, this actually... He said, can you use your tithe to help someone in their need? No. You don't have authority over the accursed thing. You don't go to swim. You give him a good and then come to swim and say, swim, somebody's hungry. Oh. <laughs> you don't have authority over the dispensing of the accursed thing. The, the person that is hungry, is, you are not the person's God. Are you the person's God? <laughs> so allow the person to find his life. You obey the principles of the word of God. If you got into big debt suddenly and God helps you to start recovery, are you meant to pay tight of your increase in that season also? The reason why you even got into debt in the first place is because you made financial decisions without God. Now that you want to recover, you still want to remove God from the equation and then attempt to recover as though it is by power. Restore God's position in your new season and see God take you beyond debt into a good land wherein flows milk and honey. <laughs> that's a laugh we turn christianity into a joke some of you said if you don't pay tight you will not make heaven you didn't turn christianity to a mockery and a joke anyone who is not paying his tight is not going to heaven full stop when you reduce the entire work of christ to mammon that a man can pay tight and he has entered heaven you are not turning christianity to more than a joke in christianity we do not preach sinless perfection we preach christ's perfection christ is more than enough nobody will make it by his efforts and until you subscribe to christ you will keep traveling to heaven and never arrive we are traveling together to heaven heaven is not a journey because you see that particular covenant it has seven blessings that go with it you can listen to your modern preachers Listen to whosoever you like. That's your own business. You can't talk me out of it. And all of you that are listening, you are paying. 
sometimes it's no more than ten percent you have to pay. Some of you are paying seventy, some are paying fifty, some are paying ninety. Because these are the problems you open up in your life. You think you are wiser than Colgate, that created Colgate Company, that started in New York like a soap making factory, and started tightening, and the thing took him. And then when he saw the blessings, he moved it to twenty. Where did Colgate stop? Is that you can Google it? It's on the internet. You think you're wide, wiser than um, what's this man uh, that founded that at one time their family was printing the U.S. currency? Eh? Rockefeller. You think you're wiser than Rockefeller? At one time he was the weirdest man on earth. Ten percent. When he saw what he was doing, the historian testimony is on the internet. Go and Google it. And he moved it to 20. He moved it. God so blessed. If you see how many universities he built, how many churches he sponsored. Because of what a pioneer, just like descendants of Abraham. At one time, one man was controlling almost all the oil business globally. He can sponsor war. I, I'm talking about world war. He has the money. You think you are wiser than them? Or these your modern preachers that are teaching you confusion? Some are turning the Bible upside down. You think it's a 21st century phenomenon? You are wiser than Idahosa that even took his own. He said, God, okay, that's a child that was born sick, that was thrown away in a dustbin in Benin. Because the father. You know, they knew that he was not going to survive. They threw him away. The mother now escaped letter, took him and ran to her place and said, at least he has not died. When he dies, we now bury him. But now to throw him alive. And that boy survived and became a preacher. A boy preacher. As a, as a young man. Piety took him and mentored him. When he read this document or title, he said, how can the employer, the owner, give the people 90 and said bring me back 10 you will you do it if you set up a business will you give your people the people who work for you 90 of your profit and keep 10 no god kept 10 that 10 is what you are still fighting over what is wrong if you see genesis chapter 3 he said to adam of all the trees please put it up let them say of every tree in the garden you will eat the only one i kept for me is one tree one one I've never seen that type of person. Only one. But the day you now cross this boundary, you will die. What did Satan do? It is that one that God keeps on himself. He will be pushing people, pushing you. 10% again. It also said no. How to leave that covenant out in your everyday life. And so we began from giving. And we looked at Two major types of giving because it's a bit controversial the first fruit giving and the giving of tithes and there were a few things we resolved from that subject the first thing we resolved from the subject of first fruit and tithe is that in the context of the new covenant you don't pay tithe you give tithe and it means a lot it means that when you are giving your tithe you are not obeying a law that if you don't do you will be cursed you are not obeying a law that if you don't keep a devourer will kill you you are not obeying a law that if you don't keep you will go to hell all of that has been handled i don't need to try to avoid cost i am blessed because i am blessed i cannot be cursed the bible said in galatians 3 13 14 18 and 19 that christ has been made a cost for us cost is everyone that hangeth on the tree that the blessings of god may come upon not just the jews now but even the gentiles and remember when balaam wanted to curse israel the bible said you can't curse him that the lord has blessed but there's no enchantment against jacob there's no divination against israel so i'm not paying tithe to avoid the cost i'm giving tithe for a superior purpose number two no devourer can destroy anything about me because the authority to rebuke the devourer is no longer in heaven it's with me he said all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me you go in that power he said in my name cast out devils he said i am seated with christ in heavenly places far above principalities and power above every name and every dominion that is mentioned so any devourer that comes in the name of jesus i will rebuke that devourer i don't need to wait for god to rebuke any devourer i have the authority in 
need Christ Jesus to rebuke devourer. And finally, I'm not going to hell because I don't pay tithe. Because tithe was not part of the contract of salvation. Jesus paid the price to save me. My job is to believe him and confess him as Lord. So long as my faith in Christ is intact and I reaffirm him as my Lord and Savior, I have a an express ticket to go to heaven. And when I appear before the judgment seat, nobody will ask me about tithe. The question that will be asked is whether the life of God is in you. Because the book that will be open for salvation is the book of life. And the Bible said, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. That life is in his son. Whoever had the son has life. Whoever had not the son has not life. Say these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son that you may know that you have eternal life. So I'm not afraid of hell because I know that I've been redeemed from condemnation. So why then do I give tithe? My tithe is an act of honor to God. I see God as my Lord. I see God as my Savior. So anything that comes to me, I must of necessity in the spirit of honor take a portion out of it and honor the Lord. So I give it as an act of honor. Number two, why do I give my tithe? I give it as an act of worship because I acknowledge God to be my source. Although I'm working in the bank, but the bank is not my source. I acknowledge God to be my source. So if I receive from God, it's only right that I show gratitude. Why do I give my tithe? Number three, I give my tithe as an act of consecration because now I belong to God. So anything that is mine must be consecrated to God. The same way I give my time in serving God because I now belong to God. For me, for instance, serving God in the house of God is not a choice. It is now what I do from the revelation that I belong to God now. So there's a portion of my time, there's a portion of my energy that is allocated to serving God. That's how my resources too are allocated to serve God because I belong to God and so I consecrate even my resources to God. Why do I give tithe and first fruit and offerings? Number four is because I love the Lord. Where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. I cannot love God and everything that comes to me, something does not leave it to God. So all our offerings are first fruit, are tithing and all our givings are designed for purposes superior to the things that are captured in the law. Whereas we said, although it is that way, the law is still not cut off because the law helps us to understand the administration of tithe. Because when the tithe comes in, there is an administration that governs it. Number one, we say the administration of tithe is for the welfare of the priest. Because the priest is supposed to be a man separated unto God who has no inheritance. So God designed it that way that when tithe comes in, it will be used for the welfare. And every church organization you see today, a large percentage of the priesthood or of the ministers are literally doing nothing. They are serving God. So for them not to be stranded while serving God, a portion of the tithe is kept for their welfare. That's why the tithe cannot be abolished. Otherwise, priesthood engagement will be truncated. Number two, we said the tithe is also for the administration of orphans, widows, and strangers. Because there are many orphans amongst us. This is one of the places people can come to and hope they will be blessed unconditionally. That's what the church is for. It's the house of God. So when orphans come here, when widows come here, and when there are strangers around us, there has to be a portion where we remove from to cater for their welfare until they are able to stabilize. So the beauty of the Old Testament and the reason why the Old Testament is relevant is the fact that it gives us insight into the administration of tithe. So from the perspective of the gospel, we know that the tithe is not abolished. Jesus said so in Matthew 23, 23. But he said it's not a major issue in the kingdom. He said consider faith, consider righteousness, consider justice these are serious matter however don't neglect this so we don't neglect it because it gives us an opportunity to demonstrate financial consecration it gives us an opportunity to honor the law it gives us an opportunity to show worship through our resources it gives us an opportunity to acknowledge God as our source and so many others that I have mentioned and apart from that it also gives us enablement to bring administration to financial matters in the kingdom of God but we know that we are doing it freely we are doing it from the place of free will no compulsion because in the New Testament, we are blessed, we are empowered, and we are saved eternally. So there is no fear. So when you look at the whole subject, summarily speaking, it represents your maturity in grace. When you mature in your understanding of grace, you will tithe. Not because you are afraid, but because it holds a more superior essence. Everything I taught, I taught it from the standpoint that our goal is not to fault the fathers who may have taught contrary things. The revelations they have and what they have taught is what God gave them for their generation. What God is telling us now is for our own generation. If we preach what we are preaching now in their generation, they may stone us. And if they preach what they are preaching in our own generation, it may not be received. Because revelation is progressive and the dealings of God is also dispensational. So God is moving. So what we teach is an update from what they have taught. After all, they were the ones that led us to Christ. We didn't wake up and say, now we need to know Jesus, we are wise. No, it is what they taught us that brought us here. But now that they have raised us, God is adding 
more syllables to what he has done before. So this is not an attempt to start pointing and say, hey, this pastor said this one. That one. No, we are dealing with different generations. They have served their own generation. It's our time to serve our own generation. And this is the revelation God is giving us. The generation that will come after us, we know the ones that we have not known from the same scripture we are reading. And they will bring things out. We'll be shocked. Was this thing there? Because they also have their own revelation for their own generation.